So what I will do, try to do is briefly tell you about EnvoPress and what it is. And then I would like to focus, uh, again, equally briefly on uh, how, uh, what exactly my job implies as a scientific editor, uh, how we handle manuscripts at EnvoPress, and the things we are doing to improve the editorial process uh, globally. And then uh, I will focus on the very important issues of research integrity and how we at Embo Press, but also other publishers, publishers do our part to improve the general uh, reproducibility of research data. So without further ado, uh, just very briefly, what is Embo? You can check it out at, on our website, but just briefly to say that we are a global intergovernmental organization uh, focused on global science policy which includes uh, important work at the policy level on bioethics, reproducibility, and accountability in science. Of course, we have the very famous fellowships programs, including short and long-term fellowships, the Young Investor Program, which is uh, uh, aimed at supporting uh, early stage researchers at the beginning of their careers. Uh, the equally famous courses and workshop programs, uh, programs supporting um, uh, tens of different conferences and, and courses around the world, and of course the EMBO Press, which is the publishing arm of uh, EMBO, of which I will tell you a little bit more. So, uh, of course, a social du duty uh, um, uh, of EMBO uh, is... Uh, also to disseminate scientific knowledge. And the journals fulfill this purpose, and uh, technically uh, uh, they are for profit, but as a matter of fact, uh, all the profits we do make, which is not a lot of money, I would say, are reinvested into the EMBO programs. So uh, ethically, it is a not-for-profit enterprise in that uh, uh, the, 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 the earnings that are made out of the journals are uh, re-injected back into the EMBO uh, fellowships and courses program. So having said that, we have four titles. Uh, you might know or not them well. Uh, state molecular systems biology, um, for instance, is not recognized usually as an EMBO press journal, but it indeed, indeed it is. And of course, it focuses mostly on uh, uh, genome, uh, uh, genomic type approaches, molecular systems, biology, as, as the name implies, etc. And I'm here today as a scientific editor of EMBO Molecular Medicine. And uh, of course, EMBO Molecular Medicine uh, aims to uh, publish research in uh, uh, um, um, areas with direct clinical and translational implications. Uh, we are interested in all model organisms uh, as long as the results are relevant to human disease specifically. And of course, when a mammalian uh, uh, model is available for a given disease, uh, that is our, uh, of course, preferred uh, uh, experimental one. Uh, human studies are welcome, include first in human and mini trials, which we are uh, now publishing, uh, uh, and, and we would like to get more. Of course, as all the all the EMBO press journals uh, encourage submission of manuscripts that are posted on preprint servers and feature one-click direct transfer from at least by archive. For those of you who are interested in the concept of preprints and preprint servers, uh, we can talk about this later uh, or whenever you, you would like. Uh, just briefly, uh, the journal is a two-person team. It's myself and my uh, colleague Celine at the journal, and we have an academic chief editor who was uh, Stephanie Dimmler until a few days ago, actually, and a new academic chief editor is Philippe Sansonetti. Although you cannot see it here, so this is the website. Uh, we have a Twitter um, uh, uh, also for the journal that I, that I uh, deal with. And I would like to, to show you my email, but it's, well, you can ask for it later. So, editorial process at Embo Press. First of all, what happens when you submit a paper to a journal? So, very briefly. Uh, first of all, it is assigned to an editor, depending usually on the topic. Uh, at Embo Press, Similar to the cell journals, the nature journals, etc., we are professional editors as opposed to academic. That is, our job is our daytime job, our full job is to look and evaluate manuscripts and handle manuscripts. We have no uh, additional uh, academic duties. 
Uh, that said, what the editor does is he or she evaluates the suitability of the paper uh, and decides whether in the first instance it should be sent out for review or not. This is a very important concept because you should know that the majority of manuscripts we receive, we do not send out for peer review based on editorial evaluation. So this is a very important concept and is dramatically different from most uh, academic-based journals where the vast majority of manuscripts are actually sent out for peer review. We can discuss the merits or the merits of this system if you would like later on, uh, but now I would like to press forward with uh, uh, the other topics uh, for, and what the editor does, of course, in case the, 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 the manuscript is uh, um, um, considered suitable for peer review, uh, the editor will contact the potential re reviewers uh, and uh, plays a very important role in trying to avoid positive and negative uh, bias, which sometimes is not very so simple for academic reviewers. And finally, the editor decides whether or not to invite for revision based on the comments and the evaluations from the reviewers, and this takes into consideration many uh, aspects. So how does an editor decide whether to send a manuscript out for review or not? And this, again, is basically the same for most professional editors at most, most journals. So first of all, there's a decision. First of all, the editor, at least we do, reads the entire manuscript and checks the existing literature, okay? And then the decision is made on a balance of uh, multiple factors, which are basically quite obvious if you think about it. So first one is scope. So is the manuscript suited to the scope of the journal? So if we receive a manuscript on plant biology, this manuscript is not going to be suitable for endomolecular medicine. Of course, it's not usual. We don't receive plant biology manuscripts, but sometimes uh, the, the decision is not so clear cut. The second important thing is conceptual advance. Again, this is a, a, a complex issue, but generally speaking, we look for manuscripts that introduce something that is really new, not just mechanistically new, but something that might change somehow the field uh, the thinking on a given topic. Then, of course, there are the traditional, mechanistic, functional, biological insights, medical impact. Uh, these are all complex issues, one by one, but we try to reach a consensus uh, uh, on a given manuscript. And, of course, if it's a methods-based paper, how useful the method is, the data set, is it useful as a resource, the completeness of the analysis, et cetera, et cetera. An important issue is that when we have doubts and we cannot reach a consensus, we might go to our senior editors or the uh, editorial board uh, to ask for advice. So we would go to the scientists, but also outside the board. Uh, we would go to them and ask them for advice. And, you know, could you just take a quick look and see if the manuscript, uh, in your opinion, uh, is a, a nice, you know, conceptually advanced package, is suited to the journal, etc. And we usually receive feedback with one or two days. So, uh, decreasing the, the time it takes for the authors to receive a decision on their manuscript. And here are our recent members, it's just to show you in red, uh, um, some of the uh, editorial members we have recruited that it somehow reflect what is happening in the field and where we are uh, a bit pushing. Uh, now, th th things are changing again, and we are pushing in other fields too, but this just to say, mitochondrial disease, we have been very successful in publishing a very good manuscripts uh, uh, in mitochondrial disease and other metabolic diseases. Of course, uh, genomics in general, but especially cancer genomics, we have been very successful. And, and of course, GNC th the cell therapy has been a very interesting uh, uh, field for us in the development of the journal. So what, what do I do, essentially, during the day in practical terms? So I read uh, about three manuscripts per day. I really read three manuscripts per day and the relevant literature. We have daily editorial meetings, uh, usually with my colleague Celine, but also across the journals when we feel that the manuscript might be better suited for another journal. Uh, we, uh, of course, we have to make the initial, initial decision. With this usually entails finding reviewers, which is a very time-consuming, complex task. And then uh, we make decisions after the review uh, and based on editorial board advice and communicate constantly with authors, reviewers, and advisors. And I'm put, listing these together because these are things that we do every day, okay? Of course, not on the same manuscripts, but these are things in flux that go on every day. 
The other things we do are attend scientific meetings, workshops, to have an idea of what is going on in the field and mostly to talk to uh, PIs and postdocs about their work and, and uh, also inviting them to submit to us. I do institutional lab visits and this is what I'm doing today of course and we work hard on planning and commissioning reviews and commentaries on topics that we feel are relevant in general, relevant for the scope <coughs> of the journal. And of course by doing so we shape the policies of the journal, but also the future of scientific publishing. And if I have time, I'll mention a few, uh, a few things about that. So, having said this, uh, I want to shift to, the, to, to, the, to, to the, the fundamental topic today and how the, our EMBO Press and the journal fits into this. Now, I would like to introduce this by mentioning an old um, uh, questionnaire that was administered to NIH researchers where they were asked to be frank, anonymously, to confess or not to certain types of behaviors. And you see a list of typical things like falsifying, which is pretty bad, but also failing to present data that contradicts one's own, overlooking others' use of flow data, withholding de details of methodology or results in papers or proposals. This, my friends, is very, very common, to present but now it's getting better to present materials and methods in a way that it becomes almost impossible to reproduce your data unless I have to, unless I call you, I contact you to get more details of the data. And this, this is something that uh, all the publishing and, and also the scientific community is trying to improve. But also using uh, inadequate research designs, dropping data points that are clearly outliers hmm, uh, based on a gut feeling, okay? inadequate record keeping. So this is just an, a, a quick overview and you will see that the numbers are quite scary and we have to consider that these are probably underestimated. So just to tell you, see, inadequate record keeping, a lot of people confess to inadequate record keeping and this is one of the main problems that we do have in the research lab. But of course you see dropping observations, you know, the famous outliers, well this cannot be true, let's get rid of it. So that's 15 percent. and. For instance, here, uh, withholding details of methodology is about 10%. So these numbers are significant. But this is just an introduction to the theme. So why is all this important? It's rather obvious, of course. So uh, doing things in an improper way uh, has destructive consequences at many, many levels. First of all, there's a primary effect. So uh, it impinges on the truth, the actual truth. Uh, that is validity of the knowledge that is gained from the paper. And of course it undermines the trust in science. It, in, in, it, it triggers a credibility crisis also beyond the scientific community, in the lay public, in, lay, uh, in the lay press, etc. And there are many examples of this. And of course there are downstream secondary effects that are linked to, for instance, the waste of resources and, and the <coughs> overall unfairness to your colleagues and to the community. And of course, harm to society in, a, in, a, in a, a global sense in terms of harm to nature, harm to individuals, and harm to patients. Of course, as many of these things, there is a, a wide spectrum, a, a very a significant gray area. Uh, so good conduct and, and misconduct, as I write here, are on a spectrum. You, on one hand, you have responsible contract, a conduct, on the other you have misconduct, but in between you have an incredible variety of behaviors that go from the honest error, which is just as it says an honest error, to uh, outright fraud. So let me say right away that outright fraud is very, very, very rare in our community. And al although outright fraud makes a lot of noise and is captured by the lay press and by the public, which is very, very unfortunate, of course, and very sad, but the real problems in our community lie here, from technical problems to poor references, missing data, what we call salami, salame in Italian, salami science, which is splitting up your, your work into more publishable units. Of course, this is your prerogative. You can do that, and you can publish it maybe on you know, less glamorous journals, but ultimately, this does not do a service to the community. Uh, then you have underpowered studies that are published. Uh, for instance, studies that uh, propose a translational message published on a cell biology journal uh, would sometimes be underpowered. 
because maybe the reviewers and the editors of that journal don't have the know-how to really appreciate how underpowered that study might be for translational implications. And of course, you have an, an, another range of, uh, of behaviors that are in between. But so why does this happen? Again, I write here, these are hypotheses. We don't really know because although now some communities and some data epidemiologists are trying to look more carefully into these issues, trying to understand uh, precisely why uh, these things actually happen, we can uh, have some, we can propose some educated guesses as a community. So first of all, we have system-wide issues. Pressure to publish for many reasons, okay? Career, funding, etc. Hyper-competition which is triggered in a way uh, 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 by the uh, 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 decreased availability of funding, for instance, decreased availability of good positions. And of course, because essentially, sadly, uh, to, uh, um, uh, this activity is low risk with high awards because uh, to uh, manipulate data is not exactly an activity which implies much more expertise beyond your very high expertise of so our very high expertise as scientists. So, so this, these are three big issues. Then you have a cultural issue uh, based on role, role models and uh, uh, this is something that can sort of change one's perspective for life. Poor mentoring, no um, um, a, uh, uh, research, uh, uh, conduct, uh, education, uh, and lack of guidance. So these are extremes, but in between we have a whole range again of poor education on these issues at the institutional level, poor mentoring where maybe a PI, a group leader, a department head doesn't really devote enough time to the discussion of these issues and therefore also lack of guidance. And finally, of course, we have individual uh, failings. Uh, justification of um, the questionable research practices. Uh, oh yeah, but that's not really a big deal. Oh well, you know, he, she is such an important, he's done so much good work. I mean, this is just, you know, a slip of the hand. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really change the value of the data. It doesn't change the conclusion, et cetera, et cetera. So this sort of uh, psychological justification. Conflict of interest, which are often not declared. Moral attitudes, I mean, if you are basically an honest person, you will simply not cheat and lie. But if you have some moral issues, uh, then it might be more difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, keep control of your actions. And then, of course, there's a personality issue, and that connects to the hyper-competition, pressure to publish, etc. So all of this is everybody's problem. So it's easy to commit misconduct inadvertently, and I connect to the honest error, cultural issues, etc. It's not easy to define good practice in practice. And the problem is, as I mentioned at the beginning, is not really research fraud. Again, this is very, very rare. We are not talking about this here. I'm trying to be optimistic. The th issue is that minor problems that we mentioned before in the scale uh, uh, it have cumulative effects, leading to studies that really do not demonstrate the point. Uh, you have a limited reproducibility, and essentially you contaminate the environment with, me with messages on which others build upon that are not really supported by, fully supported by the evidence. And we know, all know of potential horror stories where, for instance, typically a, a PhD student is asked to work on a given project that builds upon previous papers. And the PhD student fails to reproduce the data. And typically what happens is you are not able to do the experiment. You are not able to reproduce the experiment. You are, uh, uh, you are not able to uh, run according to protocol. Uh, but at the end, sometimes it turns out that everything was wrong. And there was no really, uh, the, 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 the support, sup experimental support for the data was based on flawed interpretation, fraud, uh, execution, or sometimes uh, fraud. So, so this is uh, uh, just one example of the uh, tremendous fall fallouts that we have from poor, re poorly reproducible data. So again, integrity is a state of mind. It's not really, there's no recipe. Uh, we have enormous pressure. 
And integrity requires a healthy research environment, and I'll mention a little bit more about this later. So what does this all mean? First of all, we have an individual responsibility as a person, okay? We have a responsibility as researchers, as reviewers, as authors, and editors, okay? This is true for everybody. We have a team responsibility to our colleagues, to our peers, but also to, if you're a PI, to students, trainees, early stage researchers. Then we have an institutional responsibility, which is also massively important, which implies proper training, uh, incentives, swift action, institutional research integrity office. Many, many institutions still do not have a structure that somehow equates to an institutional research integrity office, office that deals not only with disasters and emergencies, but also does prevention and helps with the education process. Uh, also, we have system-wide responsibility. That means all of us together with guidelines, publishing, etc. So, how do we do this? Well, first of all, codes of conduct. Codes of conduct, however, can be of two types. Aspirational, that means discussing values, principles, virtues. As in any other human enterprise, these are very important issues. But then you have normative, lists, guidelines, do's and don'ts. What is inappropriate behavior? I, sometimes we realize that many researchers, early stage and sometimes, scaringly, later stage, do not really have an idea that a certain type of action represents inappropriate behavior. So we need to all work together on that. And of course, uh, institutions, departments, etc., need to have procedures for handling allegations of serious uh, offenses, as do journals, okay? And of course, educational interventions that we mentioned altogether. So after this overview, uh, let me tell you briefly a, a, a few of the things that we are trying to do as a publisher together with other publishers, of course, to um, contribute to uh, improving uh, um, the, the issue of responsible, responsible conduct of research and also reproducibility of research data. So a few years ago at Ember Press, we introduced the so-called transparent process. This is just a name to indicate a decalogue of principles that we promised to apply to the editorial process. Now, I won't go through all of these, and I think you can barely see the, 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 the bolt here, but essentially I would just go, like to take you uh, through a few of these very quickly to show you how these actions can help improve the quality of the data and their reproducibility and their reproducibility. So first of all, transparent review. So what is this? And now I should say that many other journals are following in, in our footsteps and have followed in our footsteps. So transparent review is a very simple uh, idea. We publish, alongside the paper, all the correspondence that has occurred between the authors, the editors, and the reviewers. Of course, the reviewers remain anonymous, as it should be, but you, as a reader, uh, can, if you want, or, for instance, you, as a PI, as an educational tool, or as a postdoc, to learn about the process, can go read the editorial process. So you can realize what the editor told the, the, the author. Uh, the editor is in the clear, so you can see who the editor was. So what the editor told the authors, what the reviewers asked of the authors, and how the authors addressed the issues raised by the reviewers, okay? And the reviewers remain anonymous, anonymous of course, and the authors can opt out. And we also introduced this sort of revolutionary thing at the time that all comments in review reports are in the clear. We do not accept confidential remarks. And this is a, a very common uh, uh, modus operandi in the uh, uh, evaluation, the peer review process, that sometimes uh, reviewers will like write confidential remarks to the editor essentially uh, saying something that might be in contrast with the actual evaluation. So when we see something like that, we go nicely to the reviewer and say, this appears to be in contrast with your evaluation. So essentially your evaluation was okay, but now you're telling me that this should be rejected. Now, either you withdraw, you withdraw your comment, or you integrate it into your evaluation so that the authors understand why you suggest rejection or why do you don't like the, 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 the manuscript. So this is one important thing, and this is just to show you an example of a review report. You will see the title, the authors. 
the timeline of intervention, so when it was submitted, the various decisions, etc., and the translation report. This is work from my uh, colleague, and you will see everything uh, listed. This is just the, the beginning of the document. So far, you have seen a cover on a cardiovascular syndrome, and this is a paper on cardiovascular syndrome also. This is just by chance. Uh, it's not because I'm here. Uh, Mauro, so it's not because I'm here, it's just by chance. No, really. So, the second thing, reviewer cross-commenting. Again, this is a very simple concept that now has been taken up by a few journals, not many, I should say, notably, for instance, eLife. And although you might have to get the idea that eLife introduced this, but we have been doing this for a long time. So, it's very simple. The reviewers... One, two, three, for instance, in a typical configuration, are allowed to see each other's comments, again, anonymously, uh, before the editor makes a decision. And this is very useful, because sometimes a reviewer might realize that he or she missed something, or maybe exaggerated in uh, uh, um, his or her criticism, or maybe simply uh, uh, misjudged uh, some experimental part. And, and this is a typical situation where we have, at the end of the review process, I think this is from Embo Journal, uh, one said it's unsuitable. This is it's suitable after minor revision. And this one said it's in need of significant revision. Now this is a, a, a not very, it doesn't happen very often, but this is one of those situations where allowing the reviewers to communicate with each other can really help the editor make an informed decision. And, and sometimes it really helps uh, reach a consensus on the, what the editor should do about the manuscript. This is a, a quick example, simply to show that, for instance, uh, there were a number of comments, and this is a, a comment by reviewer number two, uh, who says that uh, uh, he or she agrees with reviewer three, okay? Whatever, it doesn't matter what the content is, it's not... To, to let you read this, but just so, so this reviewer, review number two, is agreeing with reviewer number three, but also says that it would be useful to do this, but it's really not necessary, okay? This is the type of thing that is really of great uh, um, uh, usefulness to us in helping, not only in consolidating our decision, but in reducing the amount of work that the authors are asked to do to get their papers published, which we think is a very, very important ethical issue in publishing. The other thing we propose, uh, we, we offer, uh, it's been a long time, is scooping protection, which means, again, very simply, if something essentially scoops in, in, in uh, traditional terms, uh, the content of your manuscript during the evaluation process, we do not take this into consideration. Your work, if evaluated positively by the reviewers, will be published. And we know of many journals that simply do not do that. You, we know that, and you might know, that if something comes out that scoops your work, you will be, get a nice letter saying, I'm sorry, we are not moving forward this because it's not new anymore. Okay? So this is one case where the reviewer is, say, is saying that a developmental cell paper essentially is reporting the same things that are um, um, contained in this manuscript. And he says, it seems hard to justify publication in Embo Journal given the previously published work of Gerhard and Hall. So, of course, the editor overruled this and went ahead and published the, the paper anyway, which we think is a great service for, for uh, the authors. The other thing that we, uh, we provide is fast process. I mean, everybody says that, but we actually do it uh, together with a few other journals. And we try to process, uh, to get a first editorial decision within a few days. Uh, and then we try to keep the review time uh, as low as possible. Why is this important? It's important because it gives you a chance to move on with your manuscript as quickly as possible. Even if you get a rejection and you, wouldn't, you don't like that, but still, you can move on rapidly without wasting too much time. And the other important thing is that if we feel that your manuscript requires too much experimentation to get it to uh, uh, an appropriate level, we prefer rejection post-review rather than telling you, yeah, okay, you do the experiments and then we'll see. And we know that other journals do apply this type of reasoning. We simply... Uh, uh, don't think this is an ethical uh, approach, 
And it also gives the authors the opportunity to think about it and say, OK, say what? I'll do the experiments, and I'll resubmit to you uh, anyway down the line. And we usually write in our letter that you know we remain interested in your work. If in the future you have data that are uh, uh, <coughs> respond to the reviewer's comments, et cetera, we are willing to look at it again. Okay. And this goes hand in hand with the informed evaluation. We try to explain uh, the reasons for our decisions. We try also to uh, show, for instance, here. This is the reviewer, uh, sorry, the editor saying, look, this thing that the reviewer has asked of you, you should do, okay? But also, sometimes we say, this is a further reaching point. You, this is not essential for publication. We think this is one of the most important things we do in our work, is we try to streamline and to the essential, the number of experiments you need to do to get your papers published. And again, here, the editor is saying, you really have to do these controls uh, for us to reconsider your paper. Okay? But also with rejection letters, we try to be informative. And this is the typical structure. Um, so first of all, we provide a summary of the paper, but not to show you that we have read the paper, the manuscript, but to give you an opportunity to tell me, no, you didn't really understand this. I was trying to say something else. So I am. Uh, exposing myself to criticism in order to ensure a fairer process. Then, of course, we explain why we don't think it's for us. And, of course, in some cases, we leave the door open, saying, well, if you could provide this, I would send it out for peer review. Okay, so this is a very uh, a basic standard issue uh, um, uh, letter where we try to explain step by step the nature of a decision. Okay, so finally, an important thing that we try to do is to engage with the authors all the time. And I encourage you, whatever journal you are submitting to, to try always to engage with the editors uh, during the process. Um, we are happy to resolve issues. Let's say you were asked for a set of experiments to perform to improve your manuscript. Then you have, a tr you have trouble. Uh, um, uh, running certain experiments, or they are not turning out the way you would have liked, uh, then, by all means, go back to the editor. In our case, we are happy to, to discuss, to mediate with the reviewers, to find, if possible, a way forward. It is not always possible, but often we have found a compromise on a way forward for your manuscript. And you should always try to engage with the editors to reach this type of, of benefit. So I will sort of conclude and go back more directly to um, heads-on with the uh, research uh, integrity and ethics aspect by telling you about one of the things we, we do, uh, which is, and, and this is the pre-publication ethics assessment on the data. Okay? This is something that we have not introduced first, and actually the pioneers in this were the journal Cell Biology, who started many years ago carefully vetting images and figures for quality and for potential problems. And actually, uh, the person at Embo Press who has started doing this learned from them, the best, actually. So what is the issue here? So data, data manipulation, again, why do people manipulate data, figures, images, etc.? Again, it might be a sort of relatively benign reason, what we call beautification. And this is intended to clarify or to improve the look of, of, uh, uh, of an image. And this is what Photoshop has done also for people, right? So this is, this is one reason. Then you have selecting reporting, which is a bit more serious. And this bias the data to fit a particular hypothesis. And we talked about this earlier. And then, of course, you have fabrication, which is deliberate manufacturing of data that was never obtained experimentally. This again, let me repeat. It's very, very rare, but we do see it occasionally. I can give you numbers later. And if I don't, please remind me, and I can give you some percentages, etc. So I, can, I, I want to show you some examples of what we see and what we do. Okay? First of all, where does this happen? It can be experimental design, and there's not much that the editor can do here. Huh? Data acquisition issues, and again, 
this is very difficult to catch, and there's not much that the editor can do. And of course, you have image manipulation, which is something where we can play an important role, and it's typically in Photoshop. And I'd just like to mention these doomsday type predictions uh, by Farid and Misteli, who was at the JCB at the time, says you can make up almost any image you want nowadays. And we know that this is basically true. But research is based on trust. And basically, it is very good health. And we have to confide in the fact that basically science is in good health, even though it's based on trust, and even though we are fallible as, as, as persons. So let me show you some examples of the things we see. So first of all, beautification. A typical thing is splicing. We see this amazingly often. Uh, uh, and, and essentially, it means juxtaposing lanes or bands or typically happens with Western blots, but also you will see with other, with other types of data that are not originally together when you collect the data. So this is very frequent. This is an example. This is the original image. When we apply our filters, our special magic, uh, again, using Photoshop, we use Photoshop to discover Photoshop issues, we, you see clearly that the, the authors had spliced in lanes. Let me tell you that this is one of those cases where all was solved by providing uh, ample source data, replicates, explanation, sorry, yeah, and ev everything was fine. The data were fine. They were just trying to make a nice gel. So this is an a, a interesting indication for, for all of us, for all of you. When you design an experiment, also try to keep potential publication in mind. And when, when a colleague asks, could you run this sample for me? Yeah, no problem. But take into consideration that then this might lead to complications in uh, extracting the figure from this beautiful gel you did. Uh, so just you know, keep, keep this in mind. But this is not prohibited, per se. You can do this. You just have to clearly declare it. And how do you declare it? By putting black lines, ample space, and a declaration in the legend. If you do that, everybody's happy, OK? This is another example. And this is you know, a manuscript I handled recently, quite recently. You see, this is the original image. And if you have an eagle eye, you can already see that there's something wrong with it. But when we applied our magic, this is what the authors have done. So you clearly see, it. not only this is not splicing. This goes beyond that. Uh, that's why I call it extreme. They actually patched in pieces, a lane, a, 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 sorry, a, a band into the lane. Okay. Now, the crazy thing about this, and the crazy thing about this is that when we look at the source data, the source data were perfectly fine. They were just trying to make an effort to make it nicer. And it, it, this manuscript was horrible. And eventually, I had to reject it. For, I had to reject it for gross manipulation. There were really bad things. And we will be seeing a few of the other things that I found in this manuscript. Um, and this was an interesting case because we didn't know what to do. Because the, the researchers, the, the authors of this manuscript in this case, were in an institution that did not have any structure where we could go to to explain the occurrence and ask them to take measures against or you know uh, uh, against the, the PI or, or, or things like that. So sometimes we are really in a difficult spot in that we can only reject a manuscript, if it's grossly manipulated, but can go no further. This is another example. And this is what we call too similar to be different, because we have to be careful in our language. We cannot tell you, you uh, duplicated this image, because you might sue me. Uh, so, because we are not forensic analysts. We are not the judiciary. We have to be very careful. We can only suggest that we found something that's too similar to be different. And this is one case. This is. Uh, it looks horrible because this is already post-processed by us. And you can see that some of these bands are actually the same. Can you see here? Maybe a little bit more squeezed, etc. But they actually paste and copied bands in uh, a gel. So this is actually a fraud because they're not beautifying here. They're making up data. If, you know, I, I'm sure you can appreciate the difference here. Now, to go back to a more benign uh, case, you all know at least I imagine that it's OK to apply filters on an image, uh, brightness, contrast, to improve 
readability, okay? But probably you have been told that this is okay if you do it on the whole image, not parts of the image, so that you don't manipulate all the image. But there's a limit, a, a, not just ethical, but also a, a sensible limit in this. And this is what I want to show here. So this was the image presented in the paper. We said, ah, but this looks a bit contrasted. Could you show us the source data? And this was the source data, okay? This was a pure protein purification, if I, if I remember well. So this is just, I mean, the authors were really not trying to do anything malicious here. This is just an, ex a cr an example of cross manipulation to make it nicer, but with no malicious intent. And this is just to show you that you can find many compromises in order to show that everybody knows what a purifi protein purification looks like. You are not presenting the image for the lay public. You are presenting the image for, for peers. And peers know what a, a purification looks like. And know, they know that it looks messy. So the important thing is the data, not the beauty of it. And so this is just to show that you can find some compromises if you really want to sort of quote unquote improve the quality of your data without going to these extremes. Of course, then you have the other extreme, which is malicious, where uh, you find this author has actually manipulated part of the image. Again, this is actually making up data because when you manipulate a single band, you are making up data. Okay, so this is really bad. This is a mutation analysis, and I just color coded for you in the same color, clearly lanes that were just pasted and copied. Okay, so this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one are the same bands. Maybe a bit squeezed, maybe, yeah, but the same bands and. This one and this one, they're the same bands. Again, sometimes they're a bit squeezed, stretched, or something, but eventually uh, these things we can find out. But as I mentioned, it's not just in gels. This can also be done, uh, can happen with images. Now, this is a nice, uh, this is an EMT experiment, okay? So, an epithelial mesenchymal chymal transition experiment, you have your nice epithelial markers, your, your mesenchymal markers, that everything is beautiful and colorful, etc. And then when we applied the filter, uh, the appropriate filters on this, we found that the authors had just taken colonies and patched them, them together in the image. Now, again, this looks so bad. But again, we found out that there was nothing malicious. It was just the anxiety to show more cells in an image, to show a nicer um, figure, et cetera, et cetera. This should never be done. But it's also to show you that sometimes it's real naive uh, or misunderstanding of what the scientists should do in presentation of data. Uh, but also the, the worst cases, again, not just in gels, uh, this is a, an experiment, as you might realize, this is a Duchenne uh, a muscular dystrophy model. And so this is an experiment, doesn't matter what it says. But when we applied our filters, this is what we discovered. Kind of look at this. The authors had systematically worked with the eraser tool to take out some. And this belongs to the same paper I mentioned before, where they had patched in the band. Okay? <clears throat> so, why is all this important? I mean, it's obvious that, well, maybe it's not obvious. I'll try to explain to you that we do this not to catch bad guys. We do this to improve the scientific record. We do this to improve the quality of uh, the data. So now I can tell you that we find issues with figures in 20% of manuscripts. But we only look at the manuscripts we are about to accept. So I don't want to even think about what we could find in manuscripts that don't even make it past the editorial decision level. Okay, So 20% of the manuscripts have issues at the figure levels, but less than 5% of these, of the 20%, are uh, attempts at making up data. So I'm telling you that 95% of the 20% issues we find are uh, bona fide mistakes, uh, sloppiness, and other issues that do not um, underline a malicious intent. Okay, I, I, I hope this is very clear to you that we are not pointing fingers at a massive fraud here, but just poor practice, okay? And what we think our mission is, is to solve these problems before you go public. Because when you go public, people will see 
pub peer will report these issues and will start, people will start pointing fingers at you and can even destroy a career just for a stupid mistake that you were not able to catch beforehand. Okay? So I'd like to conclude with a, with a famous example. So we know about, you know about the Stapsel uh, saga on nature, where uh, the, uh, the author, uh, Okibata, had uh, published a couple of papers showing essentially that acid water or lemon juice could sort of uh, uh, create uh, pluripotent stem cells in culture. Okay? Uh, it, it turned out that there was a case in misconduct, the data were not properly executed, etc. So we did the experiment. We took these two papers and we asked our resident expert, she knew nothing, she's not even a, a science person, she's more of a graphical person, so we asked her to look at these two papers just to give it a screen, as we normally do with our manuscripts, and she didn't even have the source data. Just take a look and see if you find something, okay? And do a routine check. So what did we find out? First of all, we found that one of the uh, out blots was spliced. So you can clearly see that the author says spliced. So regular stuff. This doesn't demonstrate anything. It doesn't demonstrate that the manuscripts or the papers were fraudulent in any way. This is the type of things we see very often. She also found that this was a uh, clonal, uh, stem cell clonal experiment where uh, two colonies that had been suggested to be in the same dish were actually spliced in. Again, nothing really serious. It's just minor uh, things that shouldn't happen, that we sometimes catch, etc. And then finally, she found that this is a placenta. Uh, these are two different experimental conditions. Uh, they were the same pla placenta, just rotated. Now, what am I trying to say here? Uh, these occurrences of, let's say, sloppiness do not demonstrate that the papers were, were flawed or were fraudulent, okay? There were other reasons for that, for the, the other issues that were discovered. But if the journal had only done this, probably the, pay, the manuscript would be, have flagged, would have been flagged, would have been flagged, and probably would have been subject to in, more intense scrutiny, and probably all that, uh, tragedy in a way, because there was also a suicide connected to this, as you will remember, might not have occurred. Uh, so what, we are, what I'm trying to say is that doing a pre-publication screening is important, not only for the, for the authors themselves, but also for the community to try to weed out potentially troublesome manuscripts before they go uh, public. I will not go into... Um, to, to the, 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 the plagiarism thing. You can ask me uh, later if you wish. Uh, I'd just like to conclude with a few remarks. So first of all, editors and reviewers are not data police. This is not our job, okay? We are not there to try to catch issues beforehand. Second thing, well-crafted fraud is impossible to detect. That's why I say the system is trust-based and trust-based it should remain. And the last important thing, very important thing, is that corresponding authors, i.e. Uh, uh, PIs, um, senior authors, uh, principal authors, call them whatever you wish, but the chief of the lab carries responsibility for data. So although it is true that the postdoc or the PhD student might have introduced the splicing, it is the responsibility of the senior author to check for these things beforehand. And if he or she does not do so, he or she is not fulfilling his or her obligations, okay? So what can we do as journals? Well, ensure rigorous peer review, and this is what I talked to you about today. Transparent process, proper evaluation, pre-publication check, talking with the authors, okay? Manual checks, post-publication feedback, keeping our ears on the ground for potential problems. And if problems occur, like oh, somebody reports something in pub here, check it out, see what's going on, see if there's merit in the problem. Data transparency, as we mentioned, I didn't go much into that. And of course, having an investigation and retraction policy. So typically, when, when we find something, we go back to the authors, we are a bit vague. 
we usually, if I find something in a figure, I don't back, go back to the author and say, I found something in figure 3B. No, I say, we have found some potential issues of this or this other type in a figure in your manuscript. So we give the possibility to the authors to more carefully check their manuscript, and sometimes they will come back and say, ah, yes, I'm sorry, yes, I see what you mean, I found this, and thing. I'll show you the source data, I'll do everything that's required to fix this, okay? Sometimes they actually don't know because we correspond with the corresponding authors. And this is a case, uh, the, a typical case, where the corresponding author is not even aware, which doesn't make him or her less responsible, okay? Um, just an example. So, hold on. I wrote to an author uh, asking um, him or her to, uh, th t telling, telling them that we, no, no, it wasn't me, it was Celine. Uh, so she wrote to this author asking, uh, uh, informing uh, them that we had found some issue and asking for explanations, okay? And this was the reply. So many thanks, etc. It might be a little, and she asked for source data. Celine asked for source data, and said it might be a little difficult for us to provide the false lead head, et cetera, et cetera. This project began five years ago, well, as most do. The author who performed the Western Brosser died from a traffic accident just a few years ago. Okay, don't laugh, because this actually might be true. So, so there are two tragedies here. One, if this is true, this is really a tragedy. If it's not true, it's a tragedy, because it's a horrible lie. But if it's true, and it's a tragedy. There's a second tragedy, which is that means that everything relies on one single person. Do, do you see what I'm trying to say here? Th if this is true, this is so showing that all a certain block of data relied on a single person. And that introduces the very important concept of centralized data management in a department, an institution, and many institutions are introducing right now. So centralized servers where all of you would deposit your data for storage, regardless of the laboratory. It, would be, it wouldn't be sharing your data or non-confidential. It would be a way to make sure that your data is accessible, whatever that may, may happen. And I'm not talking about a, a death by accident, but just leaving or whatever, or a dispute, etc. So this is one thing. And then the other thing this author says, before submitting our manuscript to your distinguished journal, a bit of sucking up, huh? Just say, we did not notice the requirements. I mean, what does this mean? Uh, you're either ethical or you're not ethical. So you could say, I made a mistake, sorry. But saying, I didn't notice that you wanted proper data is a bit, uh, and then this is, this is sort of sweet because the author says, I guarantee that all data are true and repeatable. Yep, so I guarantee it, so it must be. Anyway, this, manuscript was published because it was fine. Eventually, we sorted everything out. The author worked hard to retrieve the data. We fixed everything. But this is just to show you how many weaknesses might be in the system and that we have to work upon, okay? Finally, what can PIs do? Well, this is easy. Provide more education to students and postdocs. And this is one of my pet things. Discuss and view source data. I know that many PIs never look at the original source data. Uh, the blot, the dirty blot, whatever. They look at PowerPoint presentations. I mean, this is okay if you have very trustworthy senior people in the lab that can do this for you, especially if you have a big lab. But it's important never to lose contact with the actual raw data because sometimes this is where issues start. If you are asking a very early stage PhD student to present data to you already on a PowerPoint, this is already manipulation in the sense that to present the data on PowerPoint, this will already imply a step of beautification and possibly loss of data, okay? Um, another important thing, which is sometimes not easy, is to maintain an open lab environment, this, but this unfortunately depends on architecture. So many of the new institutes or laboratories that are being built today have an open lab setting <coughs> where different groups, completely different groups, share the same uh, overall space to favor interactions between people, discussions, etc. And of course, it's important to investigate allegations fairly and 
and swift action is important here. Retract and correct as appropriate. As soon as you find out something, get in contact with the journal, discuss with the editors, and things can be fixed without compromising a career. Thank you.